Mr. McCoy back with The Ear, The Eye, and The Arm, Part 11. The spire was of natural wood. It called to something deeply buried in Tendai, an ancestral memory of sitting by such a hearth and letting the smoke wash over him. Rita noticed it, too. Oh, she sighed, just smell that, it's so right. And that was it, of course. There was a feeling of righteousness about the cook fire. It must come from paying attention to the ancestors, Tendai thought. A small, heavily pregnant woman came out of the huts. Greeting, Vokama, elder sister, she said. Greeting, Mungaba, younger sister, replied the gatekeeper. Behold, Chipo, we have visitors from afar. Tendai noticed she didn't mention the city outside the wall. They are welcome, said Chipo, clapping her hands in greeting. She approached them, smiling, and then wrinkled her nose. Do you suppose, Mayanda, that our guests would enjoy a refreshing bath? Mayanda laughed. A bath is an excellent idea, younger sister, and they need fresh clothes, too. Those rags can be fed to the metal worker's furnace. I wouldn't dare use them in a cook fire. Are they going to stay? Chipo asked, with a funny emphasis on stay. Mayanda only raised her eyebrows and said nothing. The big woman led Rita off to the women's bathing area while Chapo took Tendai to a part of the stream sheltered by reeds. She handed him a strip of cloth and a loofah pod to scrape off the dirt. It felt so wonderful to throw off the evil-smelling rags and plunge into the stream. Tendai swam along the bottom over water weeds that had bent in the current and splashed to the surface beside a flat rock. Thousands of black tadpoles scattered before him as he clambered through the stallows. He scrubbed and scrubbed with the loofah pod until the top layer of skin seemed worn away. He was washing off the despair of dead man's flay. He was removing the feel of a chain around his ankle. He untied the nadoro and carefully rinsed it. These are your people, he told the unknown ancestor. Thank you for bringing me here. He fastened it around his neck again and wrapped the cloth around his hips the best way he could figure. His old rags were already gone. With a sigh of pure happiness, Tendai lay back on the flat rock and let the dappled sunlight play over his face. So much of the Valley of Rest Haven was familiar to him. He hadn't learned it from books or even from father and mother. Tendai felt a pang of guilt when he thought about his parents. He should have asked Mayanda for the holophone straight away, but he was, it was so tempting after the exhausting escape from Dead Man's Play to rest a while. Yes, thought Tendai, that's what we're doing, catching our breath. After all, we've been missing so long, a few more hours won't matter. I'll ask for the phone after dinner. Meanwhile, it was extremely pleasant to lie on the warm stone and let the breeze dry his skin. Somewhere... Not far away, he heard a drum beat. It had an earthy sound, not like the metal drum at home, of something burrowed out of a tree trunk with an animal skin stretched over the top. Now, how had he known what it looked like? The mellower, of course. Night after night, the mellower had told them stories of faraway times. He had told them how the houses were made of the weapons and how they were forged, how the pots were laid in hot coals for many days to season them. It was all part of the unending, wandering story he wove about them. Sometimes it was praise, sometimes it was history, and a lot of the time it was pure fantasy, but told with such authority that they all believed it. And the mellower believed it, too. They could see it in his eyes. That was the best kind of story, when the teller was as much under its spell as the listener. The incredible thing was that the mellower was white. He belonged to the English tribe. His ancestors had lived in a completely different way. So how could he speak so convincingly of Tendai's ancestors? The answer is simple, thought Tendai, feeling a pleasant ache in his legs as he rested from the long climb up the well and the flight across Dead Man's Play. The mellower was a Shauna slave. Aren't we lucky? A spirit decided to possess him. I wish someone would take an interest in me. But he was too contented to worry long. With his hands folded on the Nodoro, he drifted off into a dreamless sleep. So why do you suppose Tendai uh, keeps putting off calling his parents on the holophone 
Is there some subtle reason why he doesn't necessarily want to talk to his parents so quickly? Share what you think with your fellow listener. Ear, eye, and arm had trouble finding a taxi that would take them to Dead Man's Play after dark. Finally, they located an old, broken-down pirate taxi whose owner charged them four times the going rate. I'll give you eight if you wait for us, said Arm. Nuts to you, I can't spend it when I'm dead, the driver replied. The detectives checked their Nirvana guns as they sailed over the city. How much getaway time do these give us? asked Ear. Fifteen minutes. Then whoever we shoot wakes up, and remember, we have limited number of rounds. Arm sighted along his weapon and tried to remember the police drill. I sat stiffly between the other men and refused to enjoy the view. I'll get airsick and then you'll be sorry, he said when Ear tried to interest him. They flew over apartment buildings 50 stories high and as long as city blocks. People were having parties on the roofs of some of them. Ear could hear the music. Arm wished he was down there rather than flying to Dead Man's Blade. The lights below grew sparser, and presently they came to a great dark gash in the city. That's Venona, Arm pointed at the edge of the wilderness. The taxi driver went down at once and opened the door. You said you were taking us into the flame, I cried. We could have taken a bus. Take it or leave it. At least wait, Arm said, counting out the money. Waste of time. You bozos aren't coming out. The driver ran a flashlight over the money to be sure it wasn't counterfeit. Then he took off, and they watched his taillights fade into the distance. Venona's deserted at this time of night, said I. Arm noted that the houses were shuttered and bolted, and the lawns empty. Even the dog houses had locks on them. Maybe we should wait till morning, Ear said. Sooner or later, Masika's going to find out what we know and come down here. Then I very much doubt the children will survive. The man's incapable of doing anything quietly. No comrades, Arm sighed. I'm afraid it's up to us. The detectives walked carefully into the wasteland. The cement gave way to springy earth, stones, stunted bushes, gullies, and hills. The comforting lights of Venona retreated, and the watchful dark of Dead Man's Blay surrounded them. I get the feeling, I don't know why, this place is full, remarked Arm. Don't, I'm nervous enough, said I. It's not like anything I've experienced before. It's not a thousand thoughts scurrying in all directions like the cow's guts, but one mind. The closest I can describe is the feeling I get from an ant nest. The queen is at the center and all the workers mirror and feed on her thoughts. You're giving me the heebie-jeebies, here said. I thought you'd be interested. This mind doesn't like us at all, by the way. It would like to see us buried under ten feet of sludge. Shut up, Arm, said I. The detective sat down on a hill and waited. Ears spread his ears until they fluttered in the breeze. I opened his lids wide and scanned the hills and hollows. Arm pressed his fingers to the earth and felt the vibrations. They sat like this for a long time. There are people here. I hear snoring, Ears said. I see a little campfire. There's an old woman in a rocking chair, said I. Granny, murmured Arm. Anyone else? Too many bushes in the way. I moved his head from side to side, a motion that always reminded Arm of an alert cobra. I can feel several voices, but I can't make out the words, said Arm, with his long fingers splayed out on the soil. I'll have to go closer. The detectives picked their way down the hill. First came I, moving his head from side to side, then Ear, whose ears bellied out like radar discs, then R. Owls hooted and left their perches, spreading pale wings over the black ground. Rats scurried into holes, moths fluttered from under the men's feet, and a few ticks brushed off the bushes to quest for food. The detectives felt as conspicuous as one of Masika's police cars with its sirens blaring, but to normal people, they would have passed like shadows in the gloom. They stopped just outside the firelight and watched the four people sitting there. We'll get those brats and... The she-elephant made a cutting motion across her throat. I'm going to kill Trash Man when I catch him. It's not his fault. He probably thought he was playing soccer with Kuda, said Fist. You're soft in the head. You deserve to spend the rest of your life in prison. Prison? Yes, 
Freddy hissed. That's where you belong. Criminals. Sinners. You're going straight to Hades. Oh, shut up, said the she-elephant wearily. When's the last bus to Venona? Knife asked. In about 20 minutes, that's when the afternoon driver passes through. Uh, I'm going to squeeze him until his eyes pop out. Hey, what was that? Arm and shifting to a more comfortable position had put his foot squarely on one of the lay people. The person sank his teeth into the detective's ankle. Arm screamed. I fired his Nirvana gun at the creature. Intruders! Stop them! roared the she-elephant. All around, piles of trash came alive. Ear and I fired in all directions as they pulled Arm with him. So what do you suppose is going to happen next? Share with your fellow listener. It was a nightmare trip. Arm stumbled along trying to keep his mind off the pain. They tripped over bushes and slid down hollows as they struggled to reach the lights of Venona. Sometimes they came down on something soft that went oof and tried to bite them. I, remembering Mr. Thirsty's beer hall, shot knife before he could throw anything. Ear knocked down fist, but they fired again and again at the she-elephant. She's made of steel, gasped I. She came after them, snarling with rage, and her black dress and skin melted perfectly into the night. They could hear her heavy footsteps as she pursued them. Finally, after ten direct hits, she fell with a groan. She'll recover fast, panted here. Meanwhile, the Vlay people boiled out of their tunnels and tried to cling to the men. They couldn't move as rapidly as the detectives, but there were many more of them, and more still came from the lower depths. Don't lose your heads, comrades, shouted Arm. He was really telling himself not to panic. The malevolence he had felt when the Vlay was asleep was nothing to what it was producing now. It burned his mind like fire. All the insults and humiliation the Vlay people had endured from normal folk bubbled up like hot acid. It was hate rather than the pain in his ankle that threatened to overwhelm him. Ear and I dragged him the last few feet across the cement strip that surrounded Venona. They lifted him up and ran toward the bus platform not far away. Help! Help! Call the police! shouted I, but the houses were silent as craters on the moon. There's got to be a phone! Something! Ear cried. Arm's leg was bleeding badly. They put him down on a lawn and Ear wrapped in an emergency bandage around his ankle. My gun's gone flat, said I in a low voice. Mine too. We'll use his. Ear unstrapped the Nirvana gun from Arm. Arm was too weak to speak. He watched helplessly as Ear and I dragged a bus stop bench in front of him for protection. A trash can whistled past them and crashed into a wall with a shockingly loud sound. The Vlay people gathered at the border of Venona. Some of them, emboldened by the dark, actually spilled across the cement walk. They made smudgy shadows on the street. More piled up beside and behind, pushing the ones in front across the boundary. The detective stood back to back over arm, but only ear had ammunition. A chunk of cement thudded on the street, not far away. Mawari, they're tearing it up, cried I. The Vlay people reached under the cement walk and lifted it right out of the ground. It crumbled under their hands. They tore chunks loose and hurled them at the detectives. A roar echoed out over the Vlay. The she-elephant, said Ear. Goodbye, comrade. I squeezed his friend's shoulder. I'm saying it now because I might not have time later. I forgive you for not washing the dishes. It was your turn. I forgive you for not taking out the trash. Listen, he returned his face to the sky. The bus. So what do you think's going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener. And now, a few moments more of the ear, the eye, and the arm. The bus purred to a stop and dropped onto the landing pad. Instantly, ear and eye tore the door open and dragged arm inside. Don't shoot! I don't carry money! shouted the driver. We're detectives, yelled I, slamming the door. Get out of here if you value your life. The driver took off at once as the she-elephant lunged out of the vlay. She shook her fist at them. We aren't thieves. See, here are our identity cards from the police, I said as ear tried to make Arm comfortable. Arm's mind had cleared somewhat now that the emotions of the vlay people faded into the distance. I've read about detectives in books. Driver studied the card with interest. 
I didn't know they still existed. Listen, this is my last run. Can I take you to the hospital? Yes, please. Tell me, have you seen any lost children today? Asked Ear. I swapped routes with another driver. He didn't mention children, but he said the she-elephant was after him. I assumed he meant an old girlfriend. That was the woman who shook her fist at you when we took off. You don't say. No accounting for taste. The bus landed at the hospital, and paramedics raced out to care for Arm. You again, cried one of them, and Ear and I recognized the man who had treated them before. I don't mean to nag, but couldn't you people stay home and watch Holovision some nights? He strapped Arm onto a stretcher and wheeled him off to the emergency ward. Ear and I waved at the bus as it flew away. More of the ear, the eye, and the arm as the saga continues.